All right, class, welcome back. Here we are, week number seven. We got a short one for you this week. I know there's a lot to catch up on. People are getting ready to go on a now two-week spring break. Um, I wanted to let you know that there will be an assignment posted uh, in the second week of spring break. However, you will have two weeks to complete that assignment uh, just to let you know how that's going to work because this was already scheduled to be a um, online class. So that was the instruction that we were given uh, just to kind of maintain the normal schedule, even though we have the updated on-campus schedule uh, due to the health concerns with the COVID-19. So, hope you guys have a great spring break. I think that this assignment will only take about 30 minutes for you at the end of this uh, lecture, and the lecture itself should be less than 15 minutes. So, a nice quick one this week, but a very important topic that I want to go over um, uh, because I've seen this go wrong. And actually, the discussion that's associated with this um, assignment this week is based on that. For the discussion, you will see the prompt there. What I want everyone to do is, is uh, tell a story. I want you to tell a story of when you have seen professional uh, communication go wrong. Uh, the example that I will give to start that off is I was working a few years back here at the University of Wyoming on the development of a questionnaire. And we were hiring a third party organization to help with that questionnaire. And then we had a number of people on the university side who were helping to kind of guide them in their construction of that questionnaire. Well, turns out that one of the people didn't like one of the responses from the person um, who was creating the questionnaire, one of the professionals we had hired with a bunch of money. And he sent an email that was very rude and replied all, including all of the people who were contracted to help with that questionnaire. So then I had to reach out to that person individually and say, hey, did you know that you included that person on the email? You might want to reach out to them and apologize for saying that they were stuck up. Okay, So that's the one example of poor communication skills that I would give. And I hope that you guys share some fun, interesting, uh, appropriate for uh, class, because I'm sure there are some that we don't want anybody to know about. Don't share them in this class. Keep them professional. Make them about professional skills. Okay. So today, the main the theme to our discussion is that there are just too many communication options. And it's very important as you move on with your career that you choose the right one, because in the end, the question we're trying to answer with this uh, lecture today is, why do we communicate with our colleagues? And the overarching answer to that is, we need their help. There is something that we are doing that we cannot do unless we get input from this them. This could be working with your PI, and you need to make sure that they are giving you the, okay, go ahead on something for you. Or it could be that you are working as the PI and your grad student is the one who knows all the information and you are the one putting the presentation together and I need to understand this information because I can't get the presentation together without your help. So in all of these cases, we are asking for somebody's help. And what's important with each one of the different types of communication skills that we're going to go over today is that they each have their place for all of them. And we have to understand that each one of them um, should be used appropriately because that's going to determine if you get that help or not. Sometimes a person will not respond to you just because you didn't appropriately address them or get in touch with them. What I will say with these is these are my best practices. However, throughout your career, you're going to run into people who do not work well under the traditional guidelines. They might be a person who only response to text messaging. If that is the case and you go through kind of your protocol here of going through what you would normally do and they don't respond but they do respond to text messaging, well, then that's the way you're going to communicate with them. But we're going to just go over some basic guidelines here today and then I'll leave it up to you to find what works best with each individual one of your colleagues. Okay, so the five types of communication we're going to go over today. One, in person. That's one that very few people are using nowadays, but I want to emphasize overall, that's kind of your first choice. If you have the ability to talk to a person one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting in a meeting, that's where you want to go with. Number two, phone. Once again, one that's less used. I know people who will respond to 10 text messages in a row, but when I try and call them to clarify, that's going straight to voicemail. 
So once again, that's something that is dependent on the person and it's going to be up to your judgment to figure out what works best. But I'm going to go over a few reasons why you should still use the phone. Next, we'll do email and a couple quick tips. We'll expand on that just a little bit. Six ways to get your email responded to. Okay. And then we'll talk about phone through text messaging. Okay. That's becoming more and more important in the kind of uh, more immediate world that we're living in and the last one is social media so number one when are you going to want to communicate in person there's two rules that i have for this one it's very informal and you need a short answer fast so this will be something where i might be working on a grant with dr schmidt and i'm at a part in the grant where i need her input i don't know anything about circadian rhythms so i'm going to walk down the hall and i'm going to if she is available at that time ask her the question I have and she will tell me something very simple that I will put into the grant right there and then that's taken care of. The reason that I would not send an email in that case because I don't know if she's working on something immediate and I don't know when I'm going to get that information back. If my grant deadline is tomorrow and I need that information and her door is open, I'm going down there to ask her the question right away. I'm not going to send an email. Also, the number two is probably the more important when, time that you're going to need to send uh, or to communicate in person. This is when you need to have a hard conversation with a person. This is really important because it's very easy to have that quick response to an email where you are angry or that person is angry and you're going to respond back in a way that is not productive. Having a hard conversation in person adds in that level of empathy. You are taking the time out of your day to have that conversation with a person. Let's say you're overseeing an undergrad and they have made a big mistake. Well, you're not going to send them a text message just saying, hey, you dummy. What you're going to do is you're going to bring them in and say, here's the mistake. This is how we can improve it next time. And let's have a conversation about this. Same thing. What if you're having a hard conversation with your, your mentor where you realize you might not be able to hit that deadline that the two of you had set a couple weeks before? Going in, talking to them in, in their office is going to enable you to problem solve a little bit better than you just sending them an email to say, you know what, I'm not going to hit that deadline because that makes it feel a little bit more distant. If you're there and you're coming with your hat in your hand knowing that you've made a mistake, then that person who you're working with is going to be a lot more inclined to say, you know what, okay, you missed your deadline for this one, but let's see what we can do to make this happen in the long run. So kind of uh, owning a mistake that you have, and going to that person and taking the initiative is going to be more productive in the long run than just sending an email to say, oops, I made a mistake, or hoping that person doesn't notice. We've talked about that one before. So that's when you want to communicate in person. Do you need something quick or are you trying to have a hard conversation? Next, when to communicate by phone. Okay, This is another thing that people are doing a lot less of. But if you notice some of the administrators around this campus, a lot of them tend to rely on the phone more than we might assume. And there's three reasons that I think that it's important to use a phone when you're trying to communicate with people. The first one is exactly the same as before. You need a short answer fast, but that person might be located in another town, another city, another country. But once again, your grant line deadline is tomorrow and only they have that information. Pick up the phone, give them a call. Hey, Bob, uh, I need to figure out how, when I should do these blood draws for this uh, protocol. Oh, okay. Pre post and 30 minutes post. No problem. I'll put that in right away. Okay. That's when you need a short answer fast, but they're not right down the hall from you. Okay. Second one, you need to have a conversation. Same thing. Not easy to meet them. This is one that happens more times than not because generally these hard conversations or these disagreements can happen very easily over email. A person sends an email that's worded poorly and we want to get back to them immediately and send a snarky email. Don't do that. Call them immediately and say, hey, I just wanted to clarify what was in that email. Once again, you're going to have that added level of empathy in there when you have that conversation by phone. And this is a hard one. A lot of people like to have that distancing between themselves and the person when it's a hard conversation, especially if you know that person may be getting upset. You kind of can remove that if you do it by email. And I want to caution you against that uh, because, once again, 
it's that level of empathy when the person knows that you're taking the time to care about them by having that conversation if they're the person that messed up or if you're the person that made the mistake you are going to that person and saying i am available i want to make this better by being here if you want that level of separation or you want to make sure you touch on some certain points one thing i will do is make sure that i write out a list of topics that I want to cover beforehand. I might even write out exactly what I want to say word for word to make sure that it's appropriate and that I don't over or understate the severity of what we're talking about. Um, the last part of that, if you're having a hard conversation, um, if you're doing it in person and it's a really challenging conversation, make sure to have a neutral third party there. That might be your department head, that might be your mentor, that might be even another student. You want to make sure that you have someone there for support so that if things do you know kind of go downhill you have a person there to say listen i was there this is what happened okay if you're doing a phone call it's a little bit more difficult for that one you can have it be a conference phone call you could also record it make sure to look at the statutes for your state before you do that though because depending on the state the legality of recording a phone call without the other person's knowledge is you know uh it's different in the state of wyoming only one party needs to consent so if you want to record the phone call you can do that um, the other thing i might want to do is before you start talking in the phone call say hey would you mind if i recorded this phone call and if they say no problem then go right ahead with it okay that's just something that's really important because as you move on in your career you're going to have more and more of those challenging conversations and i want to make sure that everybody's prepared for that so if you can do it in person or over the phone because that's going to result in better results nine times out of ten last part is number three you're discussing a complicated multi-part question this could be something as simple as scheduling a meeting that has a lot of variables that go into it but one part one question uh, the answer depends on the answer to another question i've seen this happen poorly over email before where a person will you know write a paragraph that has six or seven questions embedded in it and the answer to one depends on the answer to the other one it would be much easier if we had that conversation by phone uh, try to avoid those when you're going into email so if it's a multi-part question that by phone is going to be best and also you could do that in person with a meeting as well especially if there's multiple people involved let's move on to the most common overall when to email okay if you need a short answer but it's not extremely time sensitive different people have different levels of um, ability to return emails quickly some people return emails within the day within the hour even but other people are more focused or maybe on travel for their work and may not be able to get that email back to you for a week maybe a week and a half okay so you want to make sure that that information is not extremely time sensitive if your grant deadline is tomorrow and that person doesn't know in advance that you're going to be emailing you uh, emailing them then you're not going to want to choose this option second if it's multiple short independent questions this is one of my favorite things to do with my grad students or when i'm asking a question of somebody that i'm working for i like to say to kind of work through whatever project i'm working on and when i get to a point where i've gotten to stopping points in multiple different places i will then create a bulleted list or a numbered list of here's my question number one here's my question number two here's my question number three and what that allows the respondent to do is then go right into that email and put their responses in a different color or maybe a different font right after yours to make sure that you're answering the questions appropriately and you're answering all of that person's questions so if you have multiple short independent questions once again those questions don't depend on the answer to the other one then that's a great place to put those into email because the person responding can go right through knock out those questions one after another send it right back and then you can move on with your project last one number three has more to do with ccing and bccing people this is when you're working in a group and you want to keep others in the loop regarding the conversation so you want everybody to be working together in the project and the person might not necessarily have to provide feedback but they should be kept in the loop as to what's going on oh are we changing the dates okay i can kind of keep that in the back of my mind 
So keeping people in the loop is really, really important, especially if maybe you're working with your graduate committee and you're asking some hard questions there. You want to keep your PI um, or your mentor involved in that conversation because that's going to help if that kind of spirals that they can be there and say and step in and be the defendant for you. Okay, so make sure to keep other people in the loop with those CCs, but don't CC people just needlessly because they were involved. Everybody involved from you know high school students through emeritus professors gets plenty of emails. We don't want to be CC'd just to be CC'd unless it's something that is relevant to the work that we're doing right now. Okay, let's take a quick little break and go to one of my favorite, favorite authors, Adam Grant, who's an organizational psychologist. He works at a really uh, great business school at Wharton, which is in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, I would highly recommend that if you want to nerd out on the best ways to communicate and some ways to be productive overall, you read some of his books and listen to his podcast because uh, I'm hooked on his way of thinking about breaking down projects. He gets probably thousands of emails per week, and he has a great way uh, of kind of breaking down why and when he will email you back. And I went through this list myself, and I'm like, you know what? I have very similar uh, kind of uh, criteria for which emails I respond to first. Sometimes it's just chance, but sometimes there's a reason why I'm going to email that person back. Okay, so let's get into this list that Adam puts out for us. Once again, fantastic list. Okay, number one perfect the subject line i hate it when i get emails that do not have a subject tell me what i'm going to be talking about make it something that piques my interest and gives me a little bit of insight into what we're going to be talking about in the email it can be something quick to the point three or four words overall but give it uh give me something in the subject line so that i can categorize it afterwards as being part of this project or that project um and that it's something that i'm going to be like okay this is important i want to read this right now next this response this uh, kind of corresponds a little bit more to if you're cold emailing somebody so let's say you are thinking about going into a doctoral program after your master's program and you want to email a mentor who you have never talked to before but you've read a bunch of their uh, research and you think this is the person that i want to work with well you want to include in that email where you're asking about potential uh, phd funding for next year why you chose them i read this article and that was really interesting and this is the work that i want to do that's why you chose them okay that leads into number three right here. Show that you've done your homework overall. If you're emailing somebody to talk about potentially being a part of their research lab, talk about one of their papers. That's really, really important. They put a lot of time and effort into those papers, so show them that you've done your homework. Same thing if you're emailing one of your professors a question about class. Show that you've actually gone to the syllabus to check for answers or gone onto Canvas to say, hey, you know what? I checked this or I tried these things to fix the problem that I was having and it didn't work. That's why I'm coming to you as a last resort. Show them that you've done your homework. Next, highlight those uncommon commonalities. Once again, this goes back to if you're emailing somebody kind of uh, cold and out of the blue. If you're asking for that PhD position, what are the things about your life and your background are similar to some of the things about their research or their research lab overall? Maybe your project has a similar line compared, your thesis project is similar to one of the projects that they've done in the past. Oh, you've been studying heat shock proteins? Well, it turns out that the study that I'm working on right now also is looking at heat shock proteins. That gives it that person a little bit of a line to draw a connection so that when they see your name, they say, oh, this is Evan. He's the heat shock protein guy. I got it. Highlight that uncommon commonality. Next, make your specific request specific and keep it short and sweet. Outside of all the research that I did in my postdoc, the best and most uh, memorable learning moment in my postdoc was when my, uh, my mentor walked into my office um, and kind of looked at me with this kind of sad look. And he goes, Evan, can I just ask you to do something for me? When you, he, he was a Greek guy, so he had a really heavy accent. I know mine's really bad right now. Um, but he said, when you send an email, just tell me what you want. I don't need 
a paragraph of explanation of why you're going through all these different thought processes and here was my first choice and then if that one doesn't work out well then we're going to do choice number two and you know i had this for breakfast today and that's why i might be choosing choosing choice number three he's like i get a couple hundred emails a day tell me what you want and then that's it and that was very very important for me because after that point i was like you know what he's right i don't need to give him my life story of why i'm making this decision Obviously, if I'm in this position overall, he trusts me. Tell him what I'm going to do, tell him what input I need, and then move on. That way he can get on to the next project on his list and move forward. Number six, express gratitude. I can't say this enough. It's really, really important. Let that person know because, once again, why are you emailing that person in the first place? Because you need their help. It could be something as simple as, yep, looks good, but that's still their time that you are taking up by sending that email. Make sure that they are aware that you are expressing that gratitude. One thing that I will say is there is no need to send back that thanks email. Never. Never send back an email after a person responds to you with the one word, thanks. That doesn't help anybody out at all. Unless they ask for a confirmation that you've received something, do not send back that thanks email. Uh, one of my buddies uh, back in grad school said that there are you know, like 10 million needless thanks emails sent every day. We don't need that in our inboxes. We know that email works. We know that you appreciate it. You can preempt that by having that thank you in your ask letter. Okay. Last one, start formal and scale back in concert with the recipient. This is really important when you're in graduate school, and I do this even now as a professor. If I am emailing somebody for the first time and I know that they have a certain title, whether that be professor, maybe they're a medical doctor, um, I will make sure to start with that formal greeting. Dear Dr. So-and-so, dear professor, you know, who's your name? That's what I will start with. I will wait until they come back and say, you know, oh, please call me Bob. Then I will go with that from that point forward. But up until that point, I will not use that. And that's part of the reason why I choose and prefer to go by Dr. Johnson in the laboratory. Because although Wyoming as, as a whole is a pretty informal state, there are other markets around the country and around the globe that have a more formal starting state. I know that if I went into my uh, PhD mentor's office and said, hey, Larry, he would have kicked me out of there on the first day. And you want to make sure that once again, you are asking for somebody's help, whether this be you're in graduate school and you're asking for somebody to guide you through the process of learning about how to properly do research and write papers and present that information. That's asking a person to do something. Or you are now a professor and you don't know something and you need another professor's help or collaborative value. That's why you start there and scale back. You're not going to offend anybody um, by calling by being too formal, but you have the potential to offend somebody by being too informal. Okay, so I would re always recommend start formal, scale back from there. So those are the seven ways I added on that last one there. I know we said six above um, to get somebody to email you back. Important. Okay, let's finish up with the last two. Text messaging is huge. I text messages with my wife probably 10 times a day about what we're going to have for dinner, which bills we need to get paid during the day, uh, what happened with the baby, how much milk she drank. That's very important information to know in the middle of your day. But these are things that happen by text messages. The first thing I'll say is make sure you have a good working relationship with that person. Start. You're not going to cold text a person just because you found their text message uh, or their uh, cell phone number uh, from one of your buddies who's good friends with them. Don't start there. But if you do have a good relationship with that person, you only want to do this if you need a short answer very soon. The word I would describe for text messaging is urgent. I need something back right away. Something that if that person is out of their office, maybe they're between lectures, they can just shoot you back a quick yes or no really quick and you can move on with your day. But it's imperative to you moving forward with a, an important project. Okay? Number two is the information you're conveying will change their upcoming plans. This is something along the lines of, okay, let's say we have a visit scheduled for tomorrow morning. 
okay? Then the subject is coming in at 6 a.m. And when that person comes in at 6 a.m., uh, we're going to do this research protocol with them. Well, I'm leading the project. I'm the lead grad student, but you're helping me out with this. The subject calls me at 9 p.m. and says, oh, you know what, Evan? I, I can't make it tomorrow for my visit. I'm going to have to reschedule. Well, I am definitely going to send all the people involved with that a text message to let them know, hey, guess what? You don't have to get up at 5 a.m. to be at the thing because the session for tomorrow is canceled. If you have information that's going to change a person's upcoming plans, get that to them soon. Okay, And once again, that uh, goes along the lines of urgency. The second point I got here uh, from Dr. Bruns, if that person is senior to you, it's probably a good idea to let them text first or to request a text. If you're working on a project with them and they are more senior to you, so if I'm going and, and working with a very well-respected MD, I'm not going to text them unless they say, hey, you know, why don't you just text me the response to that a little bit later? Then no problem doing that, but I'm not going to be the first person to do that. Um, I will sometimes send a text just so that person has my contact information with a very simple, you know, here is my text message information if you choose to use it, but I will leave the use of that up to that person. Okay, so when you communicate by text, you're going to want to try to only keep that with things that are urgent and I need an answer soon. If you don't need that answer right away, reserve that for an email or an in-person conversation a little bit later in the day. Okay, last one, and I've seen this start to happen, when to communicate through social media. You'll see that I have left this section blank intentionally, and the answer there is just don't do it. Nope, do not communicate for work through social media. There's no reason for you to do this. You have so many other uh, types of communication at your disposal. Uh, you're going to want to try to avoid communicating through social media. Uh, if you use Facebook Marketplace a lot to sell a bunch of stuff on the weekends, great. But that doesn't mean that you should use that to communicate with your boss, even if you happen to be Facebook or Instagram friends with them. Okay, It's really important to try to keep that separation between work and what we consider social media would be a little bit more on the personal side. And a lot of labs will have social media kind of uh you know, groups now. For example, I have uh, an Instagram and a Twitter account for my lab group to talk about what we're doing to publicize some of the amazing work that our students are doing. But I do not use that as a form of communication. I'm not using that to reach out to other people. What would happen if you found another person through social media that you wanted to contact? Look online for some email contact information for them and email them that way. If it's a professional co communication, don't just send them a direct message. Not the best way to get in touch. It's not as professional as you could be. This could be the old curmudgeon to me talking, but I think that's the best place to start. You know, you might find that they are best through social media, and that's a way that you can get some of your work done. That's okay. The one exception I will make for this is if it's non-work related. If it's non-work related, go for it. If you happen to be friends with your mentor or you're talking about your colleagues after work, you know, some of your other students or some of your other professors, and you want to comment on a funny post that they had or talk to them about something uh, non-work related that happened to you during the day, go for it. But if it has to do with anything, a presentation, a lecture that you're giving, any of those sorts of things, keep it confined to some of the more professional scopes out there. That's the best way to get the work done and also the best way to kind of keep that separation between personal and uh, professional. I'll tell a quick story about this and then I'll talk about the assignment. Um, I made the mistake right after my master's. I had a uh, co-author who was a uh, doctoral student who was working on my master's thesis with me. And I had emailed them five or six times to ask for their comments and recommendations on a paper that I was trying to submit for publication. And I didn't quite know the ethics of this, and we're going to go through this a little bit later in this class, about you know, when it's okay to move forward without, you know, getting a person's comments. I thought at this point you needed everybody's comments, and if you didn't receive any comments, then you couldn't move forward and you were just stuck. So I resorted to the last line of defense of what I thought, which was back in the days of Facebook and posting on people's walls. And I wrote a comment on this uh, co-author's wall saying, hey, are you going to send me those comments to the paper anytime soon? 
and I got a nasty email back from that person. How dare you, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Now, was I in the right to kind of kind of request from that person that they respond back to an email that I had sent, you know, probably six weeks earlier? Well, yeah, I was I was in the right. They should have emailed me back sooner. Should I have made that public so that they were then, you know, embarrassed about the fact that, you know, I was calling them out on social media about how they hadn't responded back to my email? That's a very poor choice on my part. And what that did is it jeopardized that conver- that relationship with a very high-level researcher, a person who's very successful now. And thankfully, the two of us have since that time gone back and I have hashed it out and I have apologized and said, you know what, that was a bad choice. I am sorry that I did that. But I don't want any of you guys to kind of go through that. That would have been a conversation that would have been best had over the phone or in person. I should have picked up the phone. I had their phone number. I could have called them up and said, hey, I'm just wondering if you had the, had the chance to look at that thing right now. And I didn't do that. I took the easy route and went through social media and tried to pressure them into doing it. And I look back on that as one of my big regrets of that in that time um, right after my uh, master's degree. So quick little story on using social media for communication for your work. Don't do it. Okay, last part of this, and I'll leave you to it, is your assignment. Uh, I'm not going to put even a rubric up for this one because this one's kind of kind of be a yes or no a complete or incomplete but i want you to have a little bit of fun with it the best one i'm going to laminate and put up in my office right here what i want you to do is create a flow diagram or an algorithm for when you should use each of the communication styles that i talked about today what are the yes no decision trees for email for using uh text messaging when do you want to do these make something that each one of us faculty members in this department can hand out to first year graduate students on their first day to say this is how our department runs on each of these things before you send that social media post consult this list of when to or this flow diagram of when to send those emails and how to best communicate with us and that's going to make sure that everybody is happy overall so take some time with that create an algorithm flow chart that gives us our yes no decision tree of when we should do each of these communications Um, you can add some humor in there if you want like i said this is just a complete incomplete assignment you will get full credit if i get a good faith effort from you Um, make sure to put your name on the top of that um, because i've noticed that with some of the the uh, submissions i don't necessarily get a name associated with it so that's the assignment for this week That and the uh, discussion where you're going to tell me a story on the worst communication blunder that you've seen in a professional setting. Um, And that will be it for this week. No assignment next week over over week one of spring break, but week two will have a second lecture uh, up with it, and we'll keep going with that. Thanks for everybody. I hope this is a nice short one for you this week, and have a great spring break.